Okay, very good morning. It is Monday 19th of August. Hope everyone is well and had a, a great weekend. Uh, going to do the usual on a Monday, look ahead for the, for the trading week. So as you can see to the calendar of the side of me, a couple of points that we can touch upon. Uh, but underlined and bolded, you can see some of the main events that are happening this week. Um, most importantly is going to be actually on Friday where we get the main speech from the Fed Chair Jerome Powell at Jackson Hole Symposium uh, in the US. I'll go in and explain a bit more of that in detail in a moment. Um, that is actually part of a three-day meeting, but again, Friday is when Powell is speaking, which will be the key one. We've also got the FOMC Minutes on Wednesday night. Uh, we've got the Flash Manufacturing Service PMIs for the Eurozone on Thursday morning. And then we've got also not just minutes from the Fed, but we've got minutes from the RBA and the ECB as well. And people obviously very much looking to get the latest kind of hints in toward the timing and size of any further potential policy easing to come from both those central banks as well. And then to wrap things up for the end of the week, you've got the G7 summit happening in Baritz in France. And of course, this is the first outing for our new Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the kind of international uh, platform. Uh, and then Trump, of course, will be always interesting to see what he has to say, just given what we're going to look at. He uh, unsurprisingly has refocused now and pivoted away from China. And he's been talking about Europe at the end of last week, of course, in the run up to the G7, where he's going to be meeting them face to face, those officials. So that's kind of the, the week in a summary. But quick look at the charts. Uh, again, Sam will give his full uh, kind of overview, both from an intraday and a weekly point of view. He'll also then issue a weekly strategy report. Uh, so keep your eye, eye out for that. He'll tweet out the details from his own account. Uh, but looking at the charts this morning, uh, relatively quiet. There's not really any major news, I would say, uh, that's occurred over the weekend. We had another mass protesting in Hong Kong. I was talking to some of my family over there at the weekend and apparently the reported numbers were up at around 1.7 million. So, you know, getting close to that, that kind of size that we had initially a few months ago when the protests really started. Uh, generally peaceful, so no violence this time, but certainly that, that situation uh, continues for the moment. Uh, but overall, other than that, news flow pretty quiet. A lot of people are still digesting this inversion of the twos tens part of the yield curve and what does that mean for then people's perception about a looming reception uh, re recession excuse me it was sam who went to a reception at the weekend <laughs> um and then that's really dominated much of the the news kind of cycle so this morning fx market's pretty quiet to be honest um, dollar index is basically flat euro dollar has done nothing so far uh, certainly some trigger points as we go through later into the week to look out for for the euro uh, sterling a little bit of a pullback a few political updates i can run you through gold pretty quiet down about six bucks the 10 year down about 10 ticks uh, with actually us and european index futures uh trading higher so actually if anything a little bit of a positive feel to the to set up this morning you've got a kind of unwind of some of the what i feel is an overhyped situation about the inversion of the yield curve um, and I think a little bit of a pullback from some of the severity of the moves from last week uh, and so equities a little higher uh, kind of unwinding then of some of that risk premium into gold and, and US treasuries uh, and subsequently uh, as a little bit of calm is restored WTI crude just trending higher as well with mimicking the equity movement and we're up uh, just taking out the highs it looks like from Friday so about 86 cents at the moment but a pretty decent start to uh, proceedings to get things underway. So let's run through, though, the news in more detail before we look at the market from a more technical perspective. And, and again, this is uh, I did a couple of tweets at the weekend because, as I said, much of the, the bank research as well as the, the kind of public financial media was all focusing on on the yield curve. And this was the first one of interest that I saw. And it was looking at the delayed tariffs have not prevented the U.S. yield curve from briefly uh, inverting. So you know, we had this kind of positive response. You saw that in equity markets when Trump delayed uh, the Chinese tariffs uh, until uh, later on this year from initially the 1st of September. But then the day after was when the market really got crushed. Uh, and hence then 
further bids into fixed income in the flight to safety, just pressuring yields even further in the long end uh, and subsequently causing the inversion. Um, the curve, though, as a statistic, um, goes from trading with a positive slope to inverting. Experience from the, the five inversions over the last circa 40 years suggests the curve will flatten further over the next couple of months. So it's kind of a couple of uh, pieces of context I wanted to provide you. So the point being here is that what history would tell us is that now that this has happened, it's likely to continue to happen for the next couple of months. Now, one thing that this is leading to as we have, you know, this is one of the biggest or interesting parts of the new period of the long term kind of business cycle that we're going to go through. Because if we are in a late phase and we're heading into the recession environment, the difference is, is that, you know, the world's never been this much in debt and certainly the unconventional methods of stimulating an economy over the past 10 years by using things like quantitative easing have really kind of almost artificially misshapen the curve. If you're going to buy copious amounts of, of bonds, then ultimately that renewed demand for bonds is going to pressure yields further. That was the point really of quantitative easing. But the point being, though, if we're going to go into the next phase of an economic downturn requiring more stimulus, well, that then is why we're getting this further push in the long end. And subsequently now, as people get more pessimistic, the long end is outperforming the short end and, and, and the yields are, are decreasing and you get the curve um, ball flattening to the point of then inversion. And so negative yielding debt, every time I, I tend to look at this this chart at the moment it's just a quite a frightening prospect um, so negative yielding debt when Tommaso was talking about it to me um, only a couple of weeks ago it's basically added uh, another half a trillion or so as it does so we're now up to around north of 16 and a half trillion and the most interesting thing here is how rapidly that's shot up through 2019 it's been incredible um, it's gone from, it's basically doubled um, the amount globally. Uh, and so this is kind of the testing point of which central banks are going to face going forward into the future. Now, talking of the curve, though, a couple of banks have said some interesting things. And, and this is one out of JP Morgan that I thought I would share. They said the yield curve message is distorted, but risks remain. Uh, and again, they're looking at distortions for the same kind of reasons that I was um, just suggesting a moment ago about the, the fact that we've had an unprecedented era of unconventional policies, which means that really this, this time really is different, um, as cliche as it sounds, from these previous post-war episodes of when we've had these kind of indicators that signal a recession. Now, one interesting point I think that JP made was this, as I bolded, uh, Treasury inversions are less a reflection of US recession risks and more of a recession of the desperation for yield by foreign investors flocking into the US dollar denominated bonds as yields turned more negative in Europe and Japan. So if you think about it, those yields are way lower at this point. And so you have to go to these dollar denominated assets, which in, in turn then, as a function of, of trying to find yield or return for investment, forces then the yields in the US to then follow suit. Uh, in not what is an underlying reflection of economic stress, but more a function of the movement of portfolio flow in that sense to still hold bond exposure. So then yeah, that, that's one of the key things I thought. The other thing as well is that I don't think it's so much about the curve it is really showing the stress right now of a, an immediate looming of a recession in America. I don't really think the data supports that. But the point being is it's about the managing now of the investor perception of a recession, you know, I, I think is a more of a threat than the actual underlying economics at this point. So again, in short, uh, I do think that this inversion, as I was kind of saying back in March when a different part of the curve did the same, I do think this is a little bit overhyped. I do think, yes, last week was a bit of a capitulation of people really buying into that, that story. Uh, and so this morning, I think the market right to have a bit of a pullback from uh, what otherwise was a bit of a, a tough week for markets globally. Okay, looking at a few different things. Uh, this is the final kind of point I wanted to make about 
um, the inversion, this was uh, quite a different point of view actually from all the negativity that I was reading. Uh, this was quite a large bank out in the Far East based in Singapore, uh, DBS, and they were talking about US equities have historically traded higher six months after the yield curve inverts. In fact, the S&P 500 has registered gains of 9.3% on average after this type of thing tends to happen. Uh, another stat there, Credit Suisse, a recession occurs on average 22 months following such an inversion. Uh, and lots of actually quite a variety of different banks talking about different time frames. But the point being from a, you know, if you're not used to this, if you're not, if you're new to markets, that uh, it doesn't, you know, the inversion doesn't happen and the recession happens next week. There is a quite a protracted drawn out period. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that there's this small thing about a US election happening at the end of next year. And if you actually you know, think about the timing, if that's about 18 months away, that's right in the kind of sweet spot where if the inversion happens now in the twos tens, it should be hitting right at the moment of when Trump's going to be looking to secure a second term. So that's what's going to be ultimately really interesting um, over the months ahead, how he tries to manage that situation. Uh, talking of the man of the moment, Donald Trump, um, as I said, you've got a G7 meeting in Baritz in France happening at the weekend. So uh, as much as he will be commenting about China, I would imagine as we get further into the week, he's going to be more and more tweeting about Europe. This is normally his tactic going into these big um, kind of meetings with all the heads of state. He goes in quite aggressive because he really wants to send a message to them before the face to face talks. Um, he said last week, just to refresh your memory, the European Union is worse than China. It's just smaller. It treats us horribly, barriers, tariffs and taxes. So. You know, holding nothing back there. The other thing, of course, that's going to be particularly interesting is Boris Johnson gets his first kind of outing on the international stage, and he's committed to delivering Britain's exit from the EU, as we know, by October 31st deadline. So it's going to be interesting to see how Trump has been very much politically aligned because it's within his matching of an agenda about taking back control and making your country and your sovereignty great again. So he's been very much a backer of Boris Johnson. It'd be interested to see how that goes down uh, the G7. Uh, and then Trump is also in the middle of a six month delay in deciding whether to impose tariffs on auto imports. Obviously a huge deal for the likes of countries like Germany, of course, um, which would mean that a decision could come on that particular area uh, in mid-November. So again, more potential stresses to come for, for Germany and Europe as, as kind of Trump pivots away from China momentarily. Um, the one thing that you're probably likely to hear Trump talk about quite a lot is France's um, fairly contentious digital tax, uh, which targets 3% of large tech companies' revenues from digital activities. Now, this obviously is targeted at people like Facebook, like Amazon, um, Alphabets, Google, and so on. And although Trump himself has been not exactly the biggest supporter of, of these big tech companies um, over recent past in his administration, certainly France, though, penalizing American firms is something, that of, of course, that the, the US president's not going to like. So again, if you're trying to ascertain the type of areas that he's going to pick on, uh, these would certainly be one of them. So Trump, definitely more to come, of course, this week. Other things still on the radar, Italy. So Tommaso's just come back. I'll get the latest update from the man himself on the ground. Uh, I'm not sure, though, if the, the rolling hills of Tuscany are the place to get the, uh, uh, the latest political insight. But you can see here, I thought that I would share this. This is a, a reflection of Italian 10-year bond yield. And this is looking at the spread over the benchmark German Bund. So, so again, in, in a most simple sense, what tends to happen is that all European uh, yields are benchmarked against the German 10-year. And what we look at then is when we get these political flashes or economic stress, the, the relative country in question's yield starts to rise to price in um, that you know, reflection of that, that negativity. And what tends to happen then is you get a further removal away from a static benchmark 10-year yield to a rising Italian or Spanish, whatever the case might be. So the wider the spread in, in that instance, the more um, uncertainty there is created. 
And so what you've got here is an explosion in the spread that happened after the political crisis sparked a bond route that was back in uh, kind of Q2 of 2018. It's remained elevated really ever since. The latest episode that we had was Silvini pulling the plug on the government. Now, the reason why I mention Italy is because the PM Conti addresses the Senate on Tuesday. And of course, we're just keeping an eye out for what the latest is because Salvini's already called for the breakup of the existing coalition. Uh, Five-star politicians themselves have talked about potentially looking to now form a new coalition then dropping their partner league and instead replacing them with the Democratic Party. So whether or not there's enough political appetite to get that over the line yet to be seen. But the thing people are looking out for here, of course, is uh, the potential and timing around a snap election. The risk, of course, that would see this spread balloon, i.e. move back up higher to retest. And there's kind of sweet spot here, line of stress, if you like, is 300. Um, that then would be along the period of um, whether the league in that instance of a national election in Italy were to, to prove as strong as they are in the polls, which is just a whisker off getting a majority themselves as a singular party. Uh, other than that, whether or not they would team up with the Brothers of Italy and so on and so forth, those would be the most um, negative in terms of the impact on Italian assets as a result. Okay, quickly looking at other things. I said Powell. Powell is the main event undoubtedly for this week and it's not coming till the end of the week there are certainly some other things to of course look out for uh, but Jerome Powell he has this Jackson Hole symposium every year uh, this was you know the reason why people really look at this quite closely is because back in the Bernanke days he came out and he made quite a, a really important statement which did give very much the latest change in monetary policy from the Federal Reserve at the time. And so people look at this as a, as a platform for the Fed chair to really give an insight into current economic conditions, but also give the latest clarity about what is it that the Fed intend to do then going forward in the future. So it's like an update, if you like, from the previous Fed meeting, the latest projections, uh, and so on. Um, what do I think that Powell's going to say? Well, actually, I think he's going to, as per usual, I think he's going to play a fairly even hand. I don't think he's, uh, he's going to um, draw too many conclusions from this yield curve inversion situation, which I'm sure the press pack will be pushing him on. The Fed before recently have said, similar to what we've been discussing, that actually uh, the curve has been influenced by other factors this time around. So there's no need to really uh, panic just yet, although they'll probably say something on the lines that they continue to monitor all market developments, both internal and external, uh, and respond to incoming economic data. The usual kind of line, I would say, will probably apply. So with that being said, just given a lot of the movements, if all things were to remain equal in, in, in generally market perception and positioning, I think that then by default could leave the doves a little bit disappointed if they were looking for power to really step up to the plate and start committing to 50 basis points in September. I think you're going to be strongly disappointed because I really don't see that happening. Market tends to agree as well at this point. Uh, we were looking at the federal funds rates futures last week and if you remember this number was getting kind of close to 30 percent that being uh, this bar on the left hand side to take the fed funds rate down to one and a half to one and three quarters that 30 percent reading has now dropped to about 12 percent and so overwhelmingly the market expectation is for a cut but a cut of just 25 basis points to the tune of about an 88 percent probability at this point obviously subject to change final thing um, just switching over to the uk uh, a little bit of a dip actually in the pound here more, more recently. I'll let Sam go into that uh, in, with more colour. But Corbyn is the main kind of headline story gearing up for an election. Uh, the Labour leader vows everything needed to stop a no deal Brexit. The kind of headline here from, from Jeremy is that we'll promise to do everything necessary to prevent a no deal. Yeah, he's going to give a speech today that will renew the pledge to hold a second Brexit referendum if a general election is called this year. Um, nothing really new there, I would say. Um, the problem isn't so much 
um, this idea that you know because Jeremy is now saying this, that means that's it. You know, Brexit's off. It's more of a challenge to Boris. The parliamentary arithmetic, as much as it's problematic for Boris now, given that it's only a, you know, one technically, and hence the reason why he might want to call this election in order to you know uh, gain a more stronger footing in the lower house of Parliament. Uh, the same principle can be applied to uh, the Remain kind of contingency, and that is that you know there's enough people in the Labour Party that would still vote to leave, uh, even without a deal, and that would go against the party line. So that means that Labour would need the support of other pro-Remain parties, that being the Welsh Party, the Greens, but most importantly the Lib, the Lib Dems. And the problem is the new Lib Dem leader, Jo Swinson, has said that she would not back Jeremy Corbyn. Now, if the Lib Dems don't back a Corbyn-led uh, caretaker government in the case of a vote of no confidence against Boris Johnson, well, then it's dead in the water anyway. Uh, the thing that really needs to happen here for this real Remain alliance to potentially change the direction of Brexit is you've got to get rid of this guy. But the problem is this guy is sticking around and he is showing absolutely no signs of leaving. Um, so, yeah, it's still very much up in the air how this is going to, going to play out uh, at this point. But uh, you get my point, what I'm saying, with the, 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 the performance of a Remain alliance. Just because he's now stepping up and talking about a second referendum and so on, the point being is, is there's, a, there's a real lack of cross-party unity that really have faith in Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, which could be a massive stumbling block. And if then, bottom line, the pro-Remain parties cannot get together to, to basically elect then a interim prime minister, well then Boris Johnson, technically speaking, could say, well, if they can't do that, then it's my right that I don't need to resign which would normally happen in a vote of no confidence against the government because the opposition can't form anything concrete and therefore, even though I've lost the no confidence, I will remain Prime Minister. So it could end up going that way as well. Lots to be, to be seen. So that's it. Let me just quickly wrap up then. So for today's calendar, very quiet. Nothing major going, coming out. I'd say much of the action really comes later into the week. Uh, overnight tonight, if you're trading the Aussie, just keep an eye out for the RBA minutes. Uh, and then, as I said, Italy may be back in focus as Conti appears in the Senate uh, on Tuesday. Wednesday, do not forget uh, on Wednesday, uh, I'll need to just correct that. The Amplify Live session is happening here on Wednesday. It's going to be on Wednesday night, not Thursday. Um, so... Sam and I will be doing a live session on our Amplify Trading YouTube channel. We're going to start at 6 p.m. London time. It's very much an open Q&A format. What we wanted to do is um, we're going to open the floor to you guys, uh, our subscribers, and we want you to lead the discussion. I've put a couple of feelers out to see uh, to get the ball rolling. A lot of you want more information about this whole yield curve story and negative yields. Definitely we can cover that, but we can cover anything else that you want to as well on the night. It's going to be me and Sam responding to your questions uh, as we take them. We then will finish that session with the full real-time coverage of the FMC minutes, which will come out at 7 p.m. So that will bookmark the end of the session. I can give you a bit of a build-up, how I would go about approaching that type of event. Then we can analyze it as it happens. Sam can kind of review it from a trading perspective. Uh, if there is the opportunity to trade, I'm sure he'll share those. Um, and then we'll wrap it up. So that'll be Wednesday night. Thursday, ECB minutes uh, will be key. And then, of course, um, PAL on Friday is the big one. All right. That is it from me. Let me hand you over to Sam, and I wish you a good week ahead. Thanks very much. Hi guys, hope everyone had a, a good weekend. Uh, we'll just start off with the, uh, the pound, as Ant did mention. We just had a, a bit of a, a drop down, really, from 8 o'clock, so that volume coming in from the London Open, and we've had uh, a push below the pivot, finding support on that first test back to what was the morning high 
uh, around 8.30 on Friday. So that remains uh, to be a key level and is one I've had written down before uh, around 124.44 uh, on the futures. Uh, so keeping a close eye on, on what happens around there and not just uh, this level, and I'll come back to the pound in a moment, you've also got euro pound and having a look at last week where we you know, couldn't quite get below so coming back to that first test back of what was the the low of the 31st of July uh, so this market very much a, a key level support one to, to have marks up and the reaction from that we're I mean, starting to see a bit of a, a reversal uh, here and if we can get maybe above the the low that we had back on the uh, the 15th you could expect some uh, a further push to the upside so both the pound and, and the euro uh, at relatively interesting points uh, overall but the euro pound uh, more so here with that low uh, of the 31st finding really strong support uh, last week back to the pound more intraday and, and having a look at uh, another test of this point now uh, a breakthrough of that I don't think it's out of the question to to get us down uh, 20 ticks or so uh, to an area of support that we had on Friday before the S1s and potential trend lines come into play and for for this market overall technically we're just having a look at it. It's uh, it's been relatively choppy as of recent. Obviously, that 120 still marked up here and worth having on, even though we're now a lot further away than where we were uh, last Monday when we did the briefing. Um, and I would just be. I think there's better markets to to trade, of course, but opportunity-wise, may well uh, the the best opportunity I should say may well happen later on in the week, and if there is some dollar strength to come with some pound weakness break of this trend and then really looking to attack that low of the, that we had of the year uh, but other other than that for the pound you've got quite a lot of resistance obviously the double top that we had this morning uh, remains key around the r1 you've got quite a, a lot of resistance going back to the beginning uh, of august as well uh, having a look over to the euro so we had this morning i'll just bring in this whole chart we had uh, a nice and we've got the trend on had a, a nice break of this trend that you see going back starting here on the 13th 14th 15th got a, uh, a breakthrough and retest so let's make this bigger now you can see of that this morning we had the push through around 7 a.m retest pivot was good and since then we have pushed higher so worth keeping an eye should we get any further retest of that uh, obviously above where we're trading you're looking here at uh, yesterday or Friday, I should say, afternoon and morning uh, high, uh, 111.30 is key. The R1 again has some nice levels like the pound does as well from previous sessions. Uh, we'd also be interested should we get uh, you know, real conf confirmation of this trend line break, what happens around today's R1, 111.60, but also a nice double bottom before a push through that we had on Thursday following those ECB comments about. Uh, their next sort of stimulus package uh, or how the market perhaps isn't pricing in accordingly. Uh, so that area, if I was draw an X around there, would be pretty key for me to, to see what happens. Alternatively to the downside, I'm just going to move this above, well, just the right hand side of the, uh, the, um, the camera. It's like with the pound, just having a look. And I know it's not necessarily a trend line yet, but potentially on that dollar strength and uh, opportunity wise looking for those yearly lows break of that trend later on in the week of course if uh, could uh, well, it could also be uh, an opportunity but for now I think with the trend line break looking to see what happens at, at these higher levels for the euro S&P had a decent uh, open uh, we're finding resistance on, on what is a, a really key level from uh, last week's trade you can see we just found really nice support 13th and 14th before that push through first retest of that at 29.20 has held pretty well uh, putting this longer term well just showing more days that August low that we had uh, seems quite far away now uh, to the upside you know if we were to get through this this level which is obviously key then you are looking towards 29.40 which is again a very important resistance from the 13th from the 8th and also the second as well. So the downside, if, if we were to, and 
this is likely to happen were to have tweets from from the, the trade war both sides then you could obviously see a, a negative impact and i'd be looking at this trend to to break but also you'd have to really get through the the high that we had on friday which really uh, acted as uh, well, didn't really act as resistance this morning overnight as we, we push through to 28.94, retested that trend line. That's when you could start to think about maybe things going to the downside. Understandably for all equities though, just coming off a touch in the US, let's bring in the NASDAQ here uh, as well. Similar uh, price action, it didn't quite necessarily make the exact level that the S&P did, but you can see they're all just coming down uh, a touch. Same for the Dow, looking at these, these trend lines to see how well they can be respected should we come back uh, to get a test of that. We'll go into a bit more detail longer term uh, for, for equities, but just for the S&P uh, as market itself, just have a look at how far away we are from that all-time high, just under 4% from where we're trading, so not too far. Having a look over to gold. Uh, worth having on the trend line from Friday's high to where, we, where we're trading now. You can see that just getting squeezed in a touch. Really solid base of support going back from uh, the 14th and then each day after that, including this morning. Bit of a zone, you can argue now as well, with the, uh, the S1 15-13 highs that we had back on the morning of the 14th as well. So nice early morning opportunity either way. You, you get a feeling here. Uh, just have a quick look and see if that's worth having on. So price getting squeezed and obviously had that spike through on the 13th uh, which was uh, last Tuesday. Really strong push but then rejection uh, down so as equities were recovering. So I'll just be for, for the gold here waiting for either a break higher uh, probably more favourably or lower underneath S1 15, 13 to target down towards uh, the lows of the 14th. But for now price just getting squeezed in and certainly looking over the last few days not too much is really happening there. Oil, however, uh, I do quite like the uh, the trend line. And if I just drag this again to make it smaller, going from the uh, the July highs, you can see just nicely respected on uh, the 13th quite well to get that third test. That's something I would have on for the remainder of the week or until if we can get up to to test that point. Pretty pretty key. Uh, trend line to, to have on just above where we're trading you can see and we've just come off a touch and made this or just about to, to make this potential trend line here you've got those uh, highs from the breakdown that we had back on the 14th and then of course uh, what will be quite a key level up in R2 with the previous support on the 14th before we did have that big day to the downside. Like with gold, just relatively choppy last couple of days, but certainly if we can get uh, above this whole mini range of the last couple will be pretty key, uh, you can feel, going forward. To the downside, quite a lot of support. We just could not get through uh, around $54. We tried on the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, uh, and didn't quite get there on the 16th, but really solid base. Also, you could argue worth, again, we like with the euro and the pound, if we were to have uh, a push to the downside, worth having a trend line on from that low of the 7th, just to see what happens should we come back to, to test that at any point. At the moment, that looks like it would come in around $55. Quick look over the DAX, which you can see as well, uh, hitting some resistance from the similar day that the US equities uh, have uh, we haven't quite made it up to maybe the, the initial low that morning before the breakthrough that's just coming off a touch after a strong uh, initial push worth keeping an eye again like with the US ones just on these trend lines which you can see is slightly better respected uh, as well you've already got those free tests on that looking to come in around the R1 uh, as well so worth keeping a, an eye what happens uh, with the DEX and Euro stocks that's coming off a touch and how that could impact US equities uh, as well any questions as usual, please uh, do let us, us know the, uh, the data calendar today relatively quiet uh, before picking up a bit into Tuesday, Wednesday uh, and Thursday. Hope you all have a, a good trading day uh, and a great week ahead.